the stadium. Tickets on sale now at fai.ie slash tickets. Booking fee applies. The Great Sofa event is now on at Flanagan Cairns in Bray. With discounts on all sofas, even on special orders. Many display models at less than half price for immediate delivery. And we've lots of other special offers in store. We free delivery, free assembly and free disposal of your replaced sofa or bed. The Great Sofa event is now on. Flanagan Cairns, Southern Cross Bray, next to Woody's and DID. Flanagan Cairns, furniture for life. You ain't shit! I wish I was 50 years younger and I'd kick your ass. My fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof it the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not lies. Stephen Rochford has never spoken to Jim McGinnis in his life. All right, you're welcome back to our Saturday panel. We are continuing with the rugby conversation. Neil Tracy, presenter of Off the Ball's Rugby World Cup show, is still in studio. Louise Galvin, straight off the telly, has rushed across town to join us in studio as well, as has Johnny Murphy, to begin the post-mortem to what happened earlier. One of the all-time shocks at a Rugby World Cup is certainly how everybody's talking about it, Johnny. Is it that, or are we still underestimating Japan? No, I think I think it's fair to say in terms of the form. You know, everyone was very excited about where they were, including me, from last week. The performance they put in and the fact that they shut down Scotland. Everyone felt, I suppose, that it was going to be weather the storm. You know, there was going to be a huge emotional uh, charge for from Japan. Whether that, you know, 15, 20 minutes ago, it's 12, 3, you're thinking, okay, you know, Fine, Japan, they're going to have another purple patch somewhere, and then you know, whether that and you know, probably ends up 25 10, and everyone's happy away you go. But it just didn't, didn't pan out that way at all. And at half time, it looked like Ireland were the ones that wanted the ball to go out. They were like, mm. get, let's just get in, get a breather. And to be fair to Japan, they were relentless from start to finish. When they were chasing, they chased really hard. When they went in front, they didn't tried to shut up shop they kept playing they just built pressure Ireland's tactic of of kicking um, trying to play the ball down there and build pressure that didn't work the kick was either poor or the line chase was poor they didn't win the scraps in the air that they did last week when they contested and it was just you, you know I, I felt that when Japan with the way they play and they were going to keep coming keep playing that would Ireland be able to soak them up and just soak that pressure by keeping them in their own half but their tactical kicking let them down they didn't find grass and that wasn't just Carty it was you know Rob Carney had an aimless kick up the middle of the pitch um, and it was just it just everything went wrong that can go wrong you look at the way the back line finished you know Luke McGrath on the wing you know with two or three different HIAs um, it was kind of a perfect storm that led into the result that it was, but you have to credit Japan, they were brilliant, but the Irish lads were first to say they, they weren't good enough either. <laughs> it's astonishing how quickly it turned from an Irish point of view, having started 20 minutes gone, two tries, Jack Carty running the show, to 20 minutes later going off the pitch at half time, looking al- already almost like a beaten docket. You know, even sensed at that stage half time wouldn't be enough that they weren't going to come out in the second half absolutely energized and a totally different team that japan the physicality the freshness everything that they had was going to count in the second half what was your sense watching it louise of those minutes before and after half time was were there things ireland could have done differently well before half time we were definitely the team that were looking for half time mm. because we needed to halt some of their momentum and we weren't doing it on the field um, Japan had started quite well then we'd gotten a bit of a foothold in the game but again even when we go back to Ireland's two tries there were penalty advantages that Jack Harty took those two kicks now I know he was trying a few earlier in the, and they were sort of coming off um, good line chases maybe maybe not good enough but it was actually off their mistakes that we were scoring as opposed to us dominating mm. the exchanges or even you know our line out going into a mall, they nullified that very early on and we knew we weren't going to get as much change out of that. Um, so when it came to half time we were looking for looking for that break to stop their momentum. Then after half time I think we came and we obviously tried to, to kick again the first few possessions we got. But we lacked so much possession and territory in that first half that we probably needed to 
soak up a little bit of possession there and get gain line. I think the overall stat at the end of the game was 71% possession that Japan had. So, I mean, how you're going to win a game when you've only 29% mm. is, it's, it's quite difficult even for a team that, you know, are supposedly tier one against tier two. And I don't think we disrespected Japan either. I think the, the squad, the team that was picked shows that we did respect them, but we just look knackered. The pack look wrecked. Um, James Ryan, I think, was top carrier or something, 16, 17 carries, but how much gain line he actually made out of them compared to usual would have been much lower. Um, I think the Japanese defence as well, they know Ireland aren't an offloading team. I mean, I think we had two offloads against Scotland, an average four in the Six Nations in total. So they know they can come in, hit, hit you high and low, don't have to worry about an offload happening and get you behind the gain line. And they were doing that. And um, then Ireland were kicking the ball back and they knew to starve the ball from the Irish because we want to play that possession game mm. so it was just so difficult they made it they played a much better game plan they made it so difficult for us I am wary of obviously being incredibly clever about all these things in hindsight and you talk about the respect that Ireland showed in not making any changes to the pack but in hindsight was that in a way a lack of respect that Joe Schmidt was thinking I can go with the same eight again or I can make have all the, the full energy for you. and I can mm. f flip the eight eight of them out next week, give them all the week off, and actually if they're at 80% this week, that'll be enough for us, we get it, and this is sort of the plan we formulated over the last few months, rather than bringing in the freshness, which is clearly what they needed. Yeah, and I, I think he was, he obviously was planning on playing mm. um, Jack Conan, instead of, I think Peter Mahoney was, who, who's, who yeah. he was meant to start ahead of. Um, but he didn't do that, particularly the front row. I mean, I know we talk about Roy Best playing 80 minutes and he, an older man on the field today who was still playing and, and playing quite well in, in Luke Thompson. Um, what I think what was surprising as well is, you know, they bring on Kilcoyne, you bring on um, Andrew Porter, but you, Porter, you take him off again when Tyburn recovers from a knock to the eye mm. and you see him looking around and I, I thought, Porter actually he'd start he just hit someone behind the gain line and he was nearly looking around going why am I going to take it off again I would have left him on at that stage because freshness is what we needed that kind of impact then also we see Ty Byrne coming on and, and giving away one or two penalties and that's not the sort of impact we're looking at especially when one was a pe was an offside you can't really blame fatigue when you're mm -hmm. Just on the yeah, field. He gave away two offside penalties in a row, um, and um, you know that that lack of discipline when you come on, and uh, that's that's massive to the momentum of a game. You know, there. I think before that, that one of them was for the penalty to go seven points up, and you're you're kind of that just sucks the life out of everyone. Those you know those individual mistakes, just like their try comes from, you know, CJ Carey and like a basic A12 move, and they run into each other. Like that's like that shouldn't happen. Yeah. You know, it's one or the other. You either just pick and you pop to twelve and you you rook, or the move is set up that you're trying to get to ten's inside shoulder and then give twelve an easier carry just inside twelves, uh, outside and inside twelve twelve shoulder, and then you rook. But like it's one or the other. They did. They hybrided both, and that's that's what was kind of astonishing for me. That even though they were up. And that you know they were four, they were whatever they were three points up at that stage. It was kind of like okay, this is Ireland should be able to just grind this out. Mm. It's not going to be pretty, yeah. but they're just going to do it because yeah. they do it all the time. And those simple mistakes are like what? It's that was the thing that really hit me. You know, you look at those critical errors at those time, offside. Not very Joe Smith at eight and a twelve running into it. Not not a Joe Smith side. Those basic errors in that real pressure cooker was like. Uh oh, they lost all those battles, yeah. and that was a big, that was that was a massive factor, I, I think, to, um, to like they're their own critical errors. Mm. You know, they can correct them, yeah, and, and that just plays into where everyone thought it was going to be the other way around. You know, Japan's want to play and keep playing. You know, Ireland were just going to kill their kill their execution errors, so we'd get the ball back, hold it. Fine, if they got it back, they're going to play. They're going to make a mistake. That was what everyone thought was going to happen, but it was actually the other way around. The tempo they played at was incredible. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Like yeah. Gary at nine, I was so impressed by, like, you know, the, just the quickness of the rocks. And I mean, if you're playing off one, two second rocks, 
how difficult it is to then get your line and then get your line speed up yeah. off that. So we didn't see much line speed from Ireland, but that's because of the speed of the rocks and the pace at which they were playing. And it was at. so quick, you were kind of thinking, right, they need multiple nines to play this. But to be fair to him, he was getting to 95% of mm, the, of the yeah. like it was so quick. He was there every time playing it. It was, he was incredible. You and know? he actually went off for 56 minutes because I remember noting he's been incredible. And he's sprinting off the field, so it looks like he's another few minutes. But rather than wait for him to fatigue, they yeah. brought on fresh legs then and uh, you yeah. know, someone to, to finish out the job, and they did. There was obviously a huge amount of experience on the field for Ireland, with the exception in the main of, of Johnny Sexton. And the footage you see at half time in the dressing room was Sexton, Conway, a lot of instructions to the players. Like maybe that is what you want at half time players who aren't actually in the match day squad, being around, geeing people up having conversations, spotting things in the stand, or actually, do you want players, do you want Sexton in the dressing room there? I think it's a, it's a, it's a happy mixture of both, to be honest. You know, Johnny would have a fantastic eye for things he'd be able to pick, and he would actually probably be able to pick up stuff that maybe Joe or Andy Farrell, you know, they, they might not pick up, but different things. You know, you look at, you know, the famous quarterfinal four years ago when, you know, like Paul was locked up, he was on a live feed on an iPad, like he yeah. was giving his thought process down. The senior guys have that ability to see and look at it probably as analytically as, as the coaching staff so that necessarily wouldn't mind as long as the coaching messages are very clear and there's no um, no one's contradicting each other then you know I wouldn't necessarily have a have an issue with that but um, as long as the messages are, are, are very clear and there's two or three specific ones that you need to carry out then I, I think that's all that's all fine would be my opinion on that I think when you're playing a game as well I certainly find anyway Johnny you don't actually you don't know everything that's going on, so certainly whether it's a coach or a very experienced player that's not in the match day squad, it's obviously very be beneficial someone mm -hmm. saying, oh, I spot this trend, or this guy, there's a bit of space here, because you're actually so immersed in what's going on directly in front of you and to your left and right that the bigger picture isn't as obvious as it is to someone at home even watching on yeah. TV. Did we see in the second half, Neil, why Joy Carberry didn't start the game? Um, I think possibly, like at that stage they were chasing as well, it was only really when um, when the the try went in that he comes on and I actually thought that there was a moment when we were following just after that try they seemed to start doing the right things very briefly and they won a penalty went down into the corner I thought Sean Cronin had just come on for Rory Best and it was a big call that went to the back of the line yeah. out to Reese Ruddock and at the time I was watching it and I was going alright like, like, that was a big call they took it in they, they started building the phases and you're going okay this is a little bit more like it and they tried a kind of a move at the back door to Carberry didn't quite work out you're still going they're getting up towards the line and you're like this is a little bit better this is a little bit better and it goes back to what you were saying a few minutes ago all of a sudden there's a penalty James Ryan got a little bit isolated yeah. ball gets turned over and that just sucks the life out of mm. everything all over again and it was the last sniff Ireland got of, of a try. But that's the, you know, that, that comes from a compounding of errors and a compounding of your decision making in the moment. Like that, that move there that, that they played off was kind of a, a, dummy, a, a dummy pop to pull back to yeah. Joey to play to edge. And if you're going to do that in, the, in, in their 22 in green zone or whatever you call it, you have to get the ball to edge because the, the rook is going to be so much easier to clean out. What happens there is Joey dies with the ball all their defence is coming forward, so all the momentum is sucked out then. So you have to restart and then go back to where your forwards are coming from, where if he just gives that pass, and he did think about it, but then didn't, and I think that was the biggest issue. He was just off the pace in those, kind, in those critical moments. Mm. He just plays an extra pass there, he gives um, Stockdale Earls, who has average side of maybe uh, Larmer, just give them a one-on-one, -on -one. You get an easy enough carry and then it's two guys clear out and you can set, your forwards can come around and reset and then go back into what, what their usual kind of killer thing would, what, what they work off. But dying with the ball there is just a disaster for your momentum because the forwards have to get straight back up, start again, they have to try and fill their lungs, go forward. That's where the isolation comes from. So it's just a, a domino effect. And in the last, I'd say in the second half, all the dominoes were falling against Ireland. You know, when they kicked a contest, the scraps were going Japan's way. Everything was going, like even the injuries, you know. And you, you look at, they didn't, I know Larmer ends up in the centre, but you look at their four centres who are there with, you know, and their two guys, they're the two other centres who would have probably been on the bench between Henshaw and, and Aki, they're not there because they're injured. And that creates then, who do you not want to lose? Mm. 
you definitely don't want to lose your 12 because you're going to have to everyone has to go in one and you have Gary Ringrose who's not a 12 playing 12 you have Larmer playing 13 you know maybe could have put Earls in at either way but you have someone at 12 who has not you know, you're down to your third or fourth choice, 12. Like, if Johnny Sexton was there, you probably would have brought him on, moved him to 12. Like, you know, that's Let's the go issue. Back to, and I know yourself and Andy Dunn have had it out on air at times, what Andy talks about Ireland's attritional style of play. Again, you think back to the All Blacks game and Kira Marmion ending up out in the wing. Another huge game at a crucial time. Mm. Luke McGrath is playing out of position. That Ireland are losing too many players through injury per game because their game plan is too overly physical. Yeah, well, Especially in these sure. conditions in the World Cup. Yeah, well, when everything is so tight and, and your squad is is so tight, then then maybe, yeah. But, you know, that is their style of play. They're conditioned to play that way. Um, should they be there not? Should, well, yeah. Should but, no, but, well, like, to play that way, though? Should they? If you're talking about how it's... For a start, it's probably not the yeah, it's probably not well, the easiest kind of play for that, tournament uh, rugby. It's not and the, then you're adding in the kind of heat and humidity as no, well. I understand. Yeah, that. It's not that I, I I don't disagree with anything anyone's saying here or disagree with Andy when we had that chat after the England game. It's not that. It's you know you can't say that because Joe Smith doesn't coach teams to play that way. He coaches them to play attritionally, to play structured. That's the way he coaches. So you can't then turn around and say, he, with the success, say, well, his philosophy is all wrong. Well, it's actually, look at his record. It's not. This is the way they play. So you have to... Uh, you, you either well, accept Lencer that. Played? Leinster did play like that. People forget. You look at stats. Like Leinster won when when uh, and Joe was there all the time that I, I was playing, and all this. They kicked the most in the pro in the Pro 12 at the time. They built pressure on that. They had their. They did have their trick plays, and they had their five six man play. You know, five six seven phase plays. That's how they played. But it was much. It's obviously the level is it, it isn't as high. So it seems like they play a lot of rugby. Where in actual fact, they didn't play outside their own ten meter line. But I think what you said there, Neil, is important. Is the context of we have played this way and gotten to number one in the world, beating mm. all the the southern nations, southern hemisphere nations. But now we're in a tournament focus. There's much less recovery time. Mm. So those bumps and bruises, they do accumulate for that mm. attritional type of, of warfare. But it's well it's well known. We obviously we've more rocks in a game than any other top tier nation. And any any time you've more contacts, it's an increased injury risk. We need to take a very quick break. We're getting uh, a lot of texts and comments in. We'll get to as many of them as possible right after the break. But the latest from Bramall Lane, Liverpool have just gone in front against Sheffield United. They've been really under the cosh for the last while, Liverpool. But a howler from the Sheffield United goalkeeper was a volley from the edge of the area from Jeannie Vinealdum that just slipped through the fingers and through the legs of the Sheffield United goalkeeper. So Liverpool on course to make it seven wins from seven to start the season. We'll keep you up to date with that as well right after these. The Saturday panel on Off The Ball. What about your man playing up front? He's on fire at the minute. Game will be over by half time. Uh, thanks, Mr Taxi Man. But opinions nicked from sports radio won't help us hit the jackpot. The Hunch just picks the first four scorers in four selected games with Betway's four to score. Conversation over. Heed your hunch with Betway's four to score for a weekly rollover jackpot. Selections must be submitted before the opening time of each scheduled round. Where there is more than one winner, main prize will be divided between winners. Full terms apply. 18 plus Dunlewy.net. At Electric Ireland, we're all about real commitment. Just like the Saturday sports chaperone who's battled through weather and traffic all season and driven further than a Kerry to Derry bus driver. It's why we keep giving our gas and electricity customers the 8.5% savings they get on day one, no matter how long they're with us. For real commitment, visit electricireland.ie. Electric Ireland. Smarter living. Estimated annual bill €1,736. Based on average consumption, urban 24-hour, discounted unit rate, standing charge, PSO levy and carbon tax. Residential dual fuel, direct debit and online billing. Terms and conditions apply. See electricireland.ie forward slash EAB. Rates as of 9th of September 2019, subject to change. Last month, the Gurnham family saved €591 at Lidl. Their shop last week included our delicious deluxe salmon and puff pastry for six forty nine, And they netted a load of other great products too. Net. Brilliant. Start your big save at Lidl.e. Lidl. 
more for you. The Garden Shop between August 14th and September 16th and receive a gratuity for participation. The 2019 Boyle Sports World Grand Prix Darts is back at the City West Convention Centre Dublin from the 6th to the 12th of October. See 32 of the biggest darting stars on the planet, including world number one Michael Van Gerwen, former Grand Prix champion Daryl Gurney, plus fan favourite Peter Wright. Get your tickets now at Ticketmaster.ie and search darts. The 2019 Boyle Sports World Grand Prix Darts at City West. Game on! While listing the reasons to book your next meeting at City West Hotel, we're also chasing a record for most corporatisms in one radio ad. Here we go. When booking best-in-class meetings, we've done the blue sky thinking for you. City West Hotel offers a price-per-delegate solution that raises the bar on value to help get your ducks in a row. With one simple call, our dedicated team ensures there's less moving parts so you can hit the ground running. And that's without a deep dive on our game-changing cuisine and convenient location that everyone can bottom out on. Touch base at citywesthotel.com and we'll circle back on going forward. This Monday, it's Man United v Arsenal in one of the league's biggest rivalries. And with Now TV, you can watch all the action live for a one-off payment of just €10. Euro. Hold on, they're checking with VAR. That's confirmed, it's €10. Euro. Unbelievable stuff. So, to only pay for the games that matter to you, grab a Now TV Sky Sports Day Pass. Search Now TV Sports. 18 plus content streamed via internet, full terms apply. Swap winter chills for stateside thrills with up to €100 Euro off return flights to North America when you book with Aer Lingus by September 30th. Spot the Space Needle in Seattle, see the stars in LA, or explore Minneapolis St. Paul's iconic music scene. Wherever you're heading this November, don't miss out on a great deal to kickstart your adventure. Smart saves up to €100 Euro by booking now. Smart flies Aer Lingus. Book now at aerlingus.com. Offer subject to conditions and availability. Switch and save at Carphone Warehouse. Save up to €189 Euro on exclusive deals with three you won't find anywhere else. Get the Samsung Galaxy S10e or the Huawei P30 with a smartwatch GT for free. Yes, free. Both are available on a €45 Euro a month plan with three. With all-you-can-eat data, but only when you switch at Carphone Warehouse. Any network, any phone, any plan. Only Carphone Warehouse. T's and C's apply. Offer subject to availability in 24-month contract. Attention. All vehicles registered in 2010 or before, it is now a requirement to have your vehicle NCT'd annually. The main reason for failure in the NCT is defective tyres. Tyres in poor condition are the main reason for an increase in the number of vehicles receiving a failed dangerous result, which means the vehicle should not be driven on public roads. Driving a vehicle without a valid NCT will result in a fixed charge offence and 3-5 to five penalty points if as a result of a court conviction. For more information or to make a booking, log on to ncts.ie. The NCT for safer, cleaner motoring. The Saturday Panel on Off The Ball. All right, welcome back to the Saturday panel. Johnny Murphy, Louise Galvin and Neil Tracy in studio. We're picking through the pieces, or certainly attempting to, of Ireland's defeat to Japan this morning at the Rugby World Cup. 53106 is the text number. Add off the ball on Twitter. We are live, as always, on our social channels. I'll get through some of the many many texts that have been coming in. The difference between the two halves was Carty. He had us playing an imaginative, expansive game in the first half. Cross kicks, wide passes and offloads. Without him in the second half, we're just kicking the ball straight to Japan, says Declan. Again, I think it's down to a little bit of lack of possession and actually, I agree that at the beginning of the second half, there was obviously a tactic where we were kicking it back down and they just weren't quite accurate enough. They weren't right in that five metre channel mm. or bouncing into touch to get that territory which I think was was probably what the game plan was looking for but after that I think we just weren't getting front foot possession that the, the Japanese were dictating the pace of the, ba- the, the game getting the ball back and then holding it for long long periods Was the game plan very different this week to last week? Not really Not really no, no Not really they probably had a few more contestable kicks last yeah. week, um, but outside of that, no, there was much were, kicking from no. Murray. No, there was more. Uh, I think the second half, their kicking was just so poor that they were just handing back. You know, they were just handing back possession easily. You know, like you look at three kicks in particular. Carty had one to the left hand corner that ended inside the fifteen. Rob Carney had one that literally just went straight up the middle of the park. And then even Peter Manny's one, which is actually not a bad kick and a bad uh, bad option. But the winger you know, he beats yeah, yeah he, he beats three guys and he ends up running half the pitch and you're like, oh my God. Where last week 
he probably would have been bundled into touch or maybe even mm. hit, hit behind the try line and got a five minute scrum that was those incidences last week we won we didn't win any of them well it was like we were just second to the breaking ball I think the vast majority of the team just looked knackered mm. like even um, their for one of their first line outs Peter Mahoney gets up and disrupts it but their uh, one of their props picks up the ball last mm. week we're reacting for us, that yeah. scrappy ball. Then, just for half time, we overthrow a line out. Uh, I think we missed another line out. Lose a scrum, scrum penalty. Mm-hmm. Those kind of, like last week, we were 100% on all yeah. our set piece. The heat is clearly a factor in of all really? that. But you do just wonder again about the team selection and the management and their awareness of where the players are mentally because obviously with their GPS and the million different stats they have a good idea of where the players are physically going into a game but did actually the toll of the last four months in camp all that focus on Scotland the pressure after defeat to England of we need to peak for this game that that's what the players did last week they were there mentally they were 100% and that that took more out of them than management realised that when they got out in the pitch there there wasn't really anything in the tank. Mm. Potentially, you're right in that sports psych that we used to work with. They said, you know, you have to, when you go up, you have to try and come down straight away and start all over again, rather than going up and then just being half. She said, when you're halfway between up and down, that's when your performances drop because you haven't given yourself the chance to recover mentally more. So she's talking mm. from a mental state, not physical state, that, you know, after a big win, you have to completely reset, start again, start your processes again on the Monday or Tuesday and then build back up to the height that you were at so maybe there's a sense of mental fatigue and what you're saying that they've had such a, a long road to what was last week t- to you know even the Six Nations definitely took a mental toll on them you know their warm-up games weren't fantastic bar one and then you know they peak as you say for last week mentally probably there is a okay right we can put all the word out of the out of camp was is just a start. So mentally, they seemed mm. from you know from the word that that people were getting and what was coming out was this is just a start. So you were people well, was were it, very this is just a start and South Africa's next potentially potentially yeah. like again I don't think they disrespected Japan no. but is there an, a slight element of complacency coming into it? Well, Owen Sheehan was at the press conferences all week in Japan and he made the point there that Joe Schmidt spoke about the South African game during the press conference ahead of this, which would be most unusual because Joe mm. Schmidt would generally very good at saying nothing and would give the stock answer, as you would expect from a coach, of this week is about Japan, nothing else, we're not thinking about what could happen down the line. But actually did acknowledge that very much South Africa's on the horizon. Yeah, and even I think, um, uh, interesting, Jamie, Jamie Joseph's comments after the game, you know, he was asked, mm. do you think Ireland disrespected Japan today? And he said, no, but Ireland have been thinking about this game since Monday. We've been yeah. thinking about it for the last year consciously, three years subconsciously, mm. because Ireland have obviously, everything's been about Scotland, Scotland, and then there's a little asterisk mm. afterwards. Once you get Scotland out of the way, you know, make sure we don't slip up like the South Africans against Japan. But that's not good enough because they're a seriously well-conditioned, well-drilled team. And their skill level, their accuracy, it was, it was a joy to behold at times, yeah. to be honest, like the, the way they played the game and the way they maintained that level of fitness. Well, apparently what they, were, what they had been doing was they'd been kind of, <coughs> obviously with the way they're, uh, the Sun Wolves and Super Rugby they kind of had these guys not playing club rugby for almost a year and I think Jamie Joseph had been conditioning them towards playing a game that had ball in play time around 55 minutes mm. so they've been kind of training with that number in mind the reality is it's normally kind of like around 45 mm. so he's kind of almost getting them into the into a position where once the 88 minute strikes they have kind of 10 minutes left of rugby still left in them. Yeah. And I think you could really see that as the game wore on, that yeah. when Ireland were absolutely lagging and looked completely knackered, that Japan still looked like they had plenty of rugby in them. And Louise, like I'm sure as well, from particularly from the Sevens background, you would have played in a lot of these places, like I'd say like Hong Kong, Dubai, these kind of places yeah, where yeah. you have that searing heat and humidity. And, and in Japan as well. You seriously feel that as those games are going on, I know Sevens is a completely different, different is, thing altogether, but it just is more difficult being out on play. the pitch in that. It is more difficult to play in those conditions. Um, even we're going to Colorado tomorrow now and the altitude, like all of these extra, um, I suppose, demands on your body that you're not used to, they challenge you mentally and physically. And the first thing that goes when you're challenged physically anyway is your, your mental capacity. So maybe some of Ireland's like that quick reaction, mm. um, their decision making was affected today. And certainly they just all over the pitch looked 
second to the ball, second to, the, to making the correct decision, um, very static with their ball carriers. And then Japan had their game plan, stuck to it regimentally, and it was the absolutely correct game plan for them. And they were absolutely full value for their victory. I think you have to give credit to the coaching staff, uh, the Jap- Japanese coaching staff. Like Tony Brown is a serious operator, and you saw the style that they played today. He's coached that style in Otago and the Highlanders. Um, you know, they have planned this journey out you know step by step the whole way through from you know what you just said uh, that it's literally they get to decide who they play and when and in their group as part of host nation they have planned and last week it was kind of like it was like just get this done just kind of it was a real nervy start it was like look just get this out of the way try and get five points and get it over we need to get out of here quick and then go on to the next one and I think people kind of thought that Japan were targeting Scotland, not necessarily Ireland. And uh, I picked up on that as well, Louise, what Jamie just said after was, you know, we've been thinking about this for however many months, for a year. That was obviously, they weren't targeting Scotland. Maybe they are as well, but they were targeting this one where everyone, and we were probably hoping or we thought, well, you know, Scotland is their chance to get out. And when you look back at the Russia game as well, you probably do go, God, they really were looking ahead at Ireland a little bit more as well, it probably explains it. What I'm looking forward to see though, well not so much looking forward to, but what could be a factor as well, the next game now against Russia on Thursday in Kobe, we're talking about the heat and humidity there, the stadium in Kobe where Ireland are playing Russia, it has a retractable roof, I know the England-USA game was on there on Thursday morning, the roof was closed for that, and I remember reading after the game, and you could see it on the pitch, the amount of handling errors the humidity yeah. was incredible yeah. inside in that place. Ball, I remember yeah. some people from the, uh, some of the BBC reporters who were working for it for, uh, for England were kind of saying that it was just stifling in there. So if that roof is closed on Thursday morning for Ireland's game against Russia, these, these things we had today are going to crop up again, surely. Well, yeah, the only thing is that, you know, you're essentially playing, uh, you know, Russia, who are the lowest ranked side, you know, as as enjoyable as, you know, Vaz's interview was after and watching them mm. play and, and all that, they are, they're really up against it. You know, their conditioning is 100% going to wilt before any team, regardless of who they're playing, because they're the lowest ranked side, their majority are, are, are amateur and, and play in Russia, so they just wouldn't have the conditioning levels that, um, you know, that any kind of uh, most other teams wouldn't so I think it would so I think that that will definitely affect them Ireland just need to I think get five points move on and rest up for Samoa I but, think this but what else do they need move. to do then so what else do they need to do over the next couple of weeks and what do you think from the body of work that's been there from Joe Schmidt he will do when he's had these type of chastening defeats they're going to have his own said earlier one training session before Thursday it'll probably be a totally different 15 anyways who maybe have had some time on the training ground but then ahead of Samoa and ahead of what is still hopefully a quarter final do you think Schmidt responds in dramatic fashion does he need to lay down a marker like does he look at that performance and go you know what actually Andrew Conway and Jordan Larmer are my 14 and 15 now yeah I, th- I think he probably just needs to make make selection decisions um, for the Samoa game and probably go into a rested up team as much as he can into the Samoa game Mm -hmm. and go full strength and try and then uh, go on from there because there are certainly going to be more injuries Um, you know the likes of Jordy Murphy if he's coming out he's going to have to feature probably before probably in the Samoa game just to give him an opportunity to get Mm 15-20 minutes just to probably let you know he could be playing in this game because if we're going to rotate that pack, mm. do you think he could play on Thursday? Well, it depends on whether he's out there or not already. See, no one knows. No one has yeah. said. Like, I know, yeah. guys, in the last World Cup and certainly in 2011, when I was in New Zealand, if there was any sense of a knock, guys were flown out straight away like so you were gone you were in a different hotel yeah. you weren't with the group he is gone even I though they haven't confirmed that he's probably that. there but well, he's he's last night, so no, I, I, I'd say he probably arrived yesterday like if he was pulled out of the Ulster game straight away I'd say he either got on a flight yesterday or he's a, he arrived after the game or he's arriving tomorrow morning like yeah. you know he's arriving on Sunday morning I hope he didn't get off the plane and look at his phone <laughs> and go oh jeez <laughs> yeah. what's yeah. after yeah. happening here stuff like that goes on especially when you're flying you know 
it's not like it was in England last time, so anyone could jump in and out. Standby yeah. list does, don't matter. Or I think there probably would look, you have to travel. So if there's standby, you'll fly out. All the provincial coaches are told if there's a doubt, they fly out, they're going to stay here for a week and then they come back. Yeah. Either way. I, that happens certainly in New Zealand with two or three players. Um, Who else is at risk? So if we look at maybe Conway and Larmer did enough last week to very much put themselves front and centre. Who else, if he's making changes from what would be the perceived first choice fifteen? Well, I'd say you, from people were games. talking about uh, p- possibility of of Chris Farrell putting himself in in that mix mm. to be. I think after today, and uh, I, I don't think he'll he'll he's probably going to get a lot of flack you know himself and CJ potentially going to get a lot of flack for for that critical error for the try. Um, you know, I, I think he's probably going to lose out. Certainly, um, Rob Kearney might, yeah. but it's highly unlikely. You know, he's very much someone that Joe relies on hugely in the big games. You know, he wa- he didn't do a, a, a huge amount today. His kicking wasn't great. Um, I thought Earls. That, I don't think there's going to be much. I think Earls. I thought it was good. Yeah. I, I, thought, I, I um, think that mm. point could be huge yeah. and he did that on his own and you know without what he, that tackle game yeah. game's done and that point could be massive and like he overtook Larmer who was yeah. fresh on the field mm. that is yeah. serious fight and want and that is the type of qualities that why he's always so on the team sheet for yeah. for Joe because some other people often question him about yeah. but they've just lost to Japan and not just lost to Japan been <laughs> battered by Japan in the second half yeah. how so can you not respond to that yeah, by but, making yeah, but who like in terms of your back line mm. today, the likelihood is of that back line that started today, you would probably say Murray will start uh, outside Murray and Ring Rose, probably everyone else. Murray Ring, of three, four of them are up for debate. Genuine debate of where yeah. of where are they're going to. Are you talking about the game against Russia now? Changes? No, no I think like we first assume. choice team. Yeah, I think I, 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 yeah, yeah, four yeah. Or five. I think you're probably you know. Aki or Aki comes in at twelve. Johnny comes in at ten. Uh, you then have a debate over who's the other winger and who's the fullback. The way Joe Schmidt handles injuries and it's, it's it's an impossible science, I guess, to know exactly how long it's going to take players to come back. So, like Joey Carberry comes back today, doesn't look quite there, but they were prepared to take the risk and name him in the squad. Robbie Henshaw picks up an injury the first week, is still there, still isn't back. It looks as though they're going to persist. Maybe he gets a start against Russia. You still worry then how long it takes Henshaw to get up to speed. He's a hamstring injury, though, isn't it? So like, mm. you know, you know, you know by your running. You know, you know when you start going up your hamstring ladder, how far you are away. Yeah. Like that's very easy to do. It's but just you have to have the hundred percent confidence to, sharpness, yeah. to, to, mm. to pull through it. That's if you're going to have to find out, and you're probably going to have to find out this week. Yeah, know? I think I think Henshaw. Once yeah. he's fit enough, plays um, plays against Russia definitely because yeah. they they need Farrell's had enough game time now. Yeah, because you'd need to you'd need to figure out that if it's not good enough, that he'd have to be a hundred percent for this week. But he certainly have to be a hundred percent in selection thought process for Samoa in the quarter final. If he's still carrying that, he's better off not being there and bringing yeah. someone like Addison out who at least will give you that cover, that extra cover in the 23 slot where he can play anywhere from 10 out. He's, he's also injured now, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he's injured, yeah. Is, he's it, injured. is it a worry that Joe Schmidt, he doesn't really, he seems to have completely lost faith in Sean Cronin. I would have thought coming into this game having Sean Cronin on the bench, Rory Best played 80 minutes the last day, I was thinking we're going to see Sean Cronin somewhere between 45 and 50 minutes probably in this match. Six, an hour is played in this game Rory Best has played 140 consecutive minutes and it's only after Ireland have conceded that try that Sean Cronin has finally put on like I do think I think and Louise you said that earlier, I, I do think the Irish management got that wrong mm. you know I was thinking and exactly what you said Louise when Porter came off and you could see him on the TV going like what 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 like Leave him on, you know. I don't think. What are you going to get from Tyke Furlong coming back on? And I 100% agree there. I think those changes should have been made earlier and stuck to. Like so, the you're forced into a change that you're probably going to make in 10 minutes time anyway. Leave him on. Leave Andrew Porter on. You know, with fresh legs. You know, give Sean Cronin the opportunity to do something for half an hour because he has that explosive uh, power. He can create something out of nothing. And I think that was definitely something that the management. I think got wrong 
uh, today in terms of their, their bench. But then you also have to think about what was going on in the back line. Are they thinking, well, if we lose another one, then we might go down to 14. So you don't yeah. know what their conversations were because of the knocks that they'd taken already in the back line. On top of that as well, I think um, we already have Peter Mahoney off the field. Sexton isn't there, so he's probably looking at leadership and yeah. thinking, I we're in a game here, mm. we're 12-9, mm -hmm. um, I need to keep my leaders on the field. So I imagine he might have planned on bringing Sean Croner on earlier, but the the pattern of the game and the score, scoreboard made him stick with best, even though two lineups had gone astray, which might not be completely obviously on, on the thrower. But in fairness to Croner, he came on and nailed two. Yeah. Nailed the tail straight away, just like you said. Dave and Kildare is wondering about the six-day turnaround. It's been known for months. The humidity was known well in advance. It's up to team management to make sure the team is prepared for these factors. Like everything we hear is this is the best prepared team we've ever sent to a World Cup. We do snigger a little bit when we hear of other teams putting shampoo on their rugby balls and things like that to prepare for such eventualities. Maybe we're just not thinking radically enough. Maybe, but we won't really know until the end of Shampoo and rugby balls. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, they went to Portugal, they went to the Heat, they went to Japan two years, years ago in mm. 2017. I know even from, in terms of their food, their nutritionist, Ruth Wood Martin, she'd have been over in Japan. They're trying to control everything that's mm. controllable. Um, I just think they went with what they perceived to be a very strong starting team that actually turned out to be a fatigue team. And that was something that maybe the regret and in hindsight is uh, is the learning. How about giving Japan a bit of credit? They played their hearts out. It wasn't all about Ireland being poor. They had the climb of the crowd and the hearts of 15 heroic players against them today. I think you have given Japan oh, plenty of credit. Brilliant. They oh, were yeah. brilliant. Like, it would be very exciting oh, if actually <laughs> Japan are at that level yeah. Yeah. against Scotland yeah. and heading towards a quarter-final. Yeah, like, you, you know, if they were at that level and they were potentially playing South Africa with the way South Africa play and their size, it is a perfect matchup in terms of um, for... For, yeah, for contrast, mm -hmm. you know, Japan play them in a quarter final, and they play that way. They move the ball around. They're moving. You could find where you know they could potentially beat South Africa because they fatigue them so much and they take a lot of gas out of their ball carrying ability. So, yeah, like they were brilliant today. I don't think any, I think everyone from the start has probably has given them a huge amount of credit. They're just trying to dissect where it's gone wrong from Ireland because mm -hmm. Ireland were after last week. We were hoping that. You know, not just the semi-final, but there were there were, people might have been getting carried away, but they felt that things had changed and they were back where they were this time last year. But then, when we now look back at last week, because a lot of people were saying, "Well, that was a poor enough Scotland performance." Yeah. I remember analysing before today and looking at going, "God, Scotland, there, you know, okay, we got that turnover, but actually, we shouldn't have. They ran support lines instead of resourcing a rook. Are Scotland poor? Were we ahead of ourselves because?" Well, yeah, we dismantled them, but are they at the races? And now if Japan go and do a job How in them... How bad are Scotland, <laughs> yeah, potentially? Yeah. Like. But, well, potentially, you know, that's nearly yeah. the fear. So that you don't... It's just very hard to understand the form guidelines in our, in our, in our group, especially, you know, because you just don't know what, what Scotland are going to play. Yeah, out, Scotland are just know. one of those teams. Yeah, and you see, Scotland yeah. could have been, like, like kind of game against England, that's Scotland in a nutshell. And Scotland know? could have been listening to all the hype. This side, yeah. the, this in the Northern Hemisphere, like, well, look, Japan are really targeting you guys mm. you know so they could be thinking look we need to get have you know two wins out of three by the time we get to Japan and then we need that's where we get our quarter-final spot you know you don't know what what what, what kind of way things have uh, have landed but um, yeah it's a it's an interesting form book to try and study but it's very hard Josh Schmidt uh, touched on the refereeing after the game and the amount of penalties that Ireland gave away uh, Shane and Selbridge saying the reason we lost that game was down to the referee called penalties in Ireland where none existed this happened on three occasions at the Japanese line was there anything that, in the refereeing no, of the game? I don't think so I, I think they were offside it was clear for the ones the, the ones that really matter in terms of offside they were clear offside lines um, there's probably certain thing, things that I think he missed more so than penalised Ireland for I certainly think he missed a couple of their deep cleans going past which they've gotten rid of now you're not allowed to go the you're, ball you're not allowed to go beyond the ball carry and I think that they did that a couple of times Tyke Furlong tried to make it known to the ref and he was up there's a couple of times where Murray is talking to him and he's telling the six roll six roll six mm. and Murray's trying to pick the ball up and he's stopping Murray to pick the ball up 
Agnes Gardner's like, roll, 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 roll. He doesn't. Murray eventually gets the ball and plays, where you're kind of like, hold on a second. How many chances How many chances are you going to give him? And there, that's a kickable opportunity there. I think Ireland were still in front, and that was Murray was talking to him about that. So I think there was a couple of things that he missed rather than penalised that I think Ireland could be more aggrieved about. Yeah, I think um, the penalty count in ways, I know it's higher than what... Ireland normally give away but I think it's a reflection of the pressure that they're yeah, under, yeah. particularly some of those offside ones sometimes being offside is lazy sometimes it is you're absolutely you're just tired you're yeah. just absolutely yeah. wrecked and you're constantly being pushed back pushed back and you're trying to get a photo and trying to get some line speed um, two rocks that are uh, I don't think Joe Schmidt would be happy about it would be just you know they're coming through balls out and they're picking up the ball and there's actually players around it yeah. I think that one of them happened in each half and again that's not very characteristic of this Irish squad and I think it just ties in with their whole performance of just being a bit lacklustre yeah yeah. We've a lot of texts coming in about um, the reaction to a defeat to the Irish rugby team and the reaction to a f- defeat for an Irish football team. Even Tomás O'Shea has been on Twitter saying, rugby disappointing question, why don't Irish rugby pundits call it out for the poor performance it was? Excuses given, maybe I'm wrong, I thought we were bullied and outfought. I, and I know I don't know much about it, but if it was soccer GA, they'd be ripped apart. I'd honestly love to know, has that guy been listening for the last 90 minutes? I don't know if he has been listening. We had, we had Owen on from, from Japan <laughs> for the first half an hour. We have had this panel here for the last the guts of an hour or so. Like, well, I, I think have, we, have we been have we been kind look, to Ireland? There was there was a sense of people getting possibly carried away after the Scotland game yep. because there was so much and so many questions about the team going into the Scotland game that actually, now we look at hindsight and say Ireland are well ahead of Scotland. But yeah. before the game, because it's been such a mess, there was a sense, well, actually, maybe Ireland don't, maybe that performance today happened last week. Mm. It's a totally different conversation. But when you go and you turn up and you perform and you dominate, I think people can expect a repeat of that this week mm-hmm. and that you're putting yourself in a position to give a good account of yourself. There is a different way that the football team and the rugby team are judged. There's no question about that. I see a million clips of Keith Earls doing brilliantly if Seamus Coleman cleared the ball off the line in the last minute of a football game and Ireland were beaten, is he getting that sort of credit? No chance. No, no, but, no, he, I, no I but you don't James get bonus McClain, points. Big James McLean tackle. Oh. An old reducer. And he was all loading nonsense. I know, yeah. It is all loading nonsense. <laughs> so, what, what, are you, what are you expecting now? What, what do you it. think we're, happens next? I think part of the reason we're not all, you know, how house private no flowers please <laughs> is because it's still a tournament we're still in it yeah. and crucially because of Keith Earls making that last ditch tackle and Joey Carberry kicking the ball out our destiny is still in our own hands in that if we get two bonus point victories out of Samoa and Russia which if we don't well then we aren't within an arse roar anyway of mm. being anywhere near the top end of a World Cup um, then we're through to a quarter final what happens between um Scotland and Japan dictates who we play in that. Mm. You know, if, if Scotland get a win in Japan and we get two bonus point victories, we could still be up against yeah, South even, Africa. Even two victories on their own, like two two bad victories, is still enough to get to a quarter mm. final. Uh, you wouldn't be too confident uh, going into a quarter yeah, well, final. I think if, if South Japan, Africa, go, New yeah. Zealand, but yeah. like if Japan win the rest of their games, we win our two, we get out. Like yeah. you know, our second yeah. is pretty. We play pretty New pretty Zealand. Yeah, play New Zealand. Um, Do we see Sexton before the quarterfinals? Oh, of course, yeah, I, think Charlie, I, think, yeah. I think I think he's probably. He's played so little rugby. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he might. You might start Joey Carberry given the fact that you're playing Russia this week to try and get him a, an opportunity. But you probably have Johnny on the bench, and you're certainly going to start him against Samoa because that's a massive game. Mm. Like, but then with there, the there's no way. Well. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> Ireland, is, like, is that one of the things actually that's changed there? What Louise is touching on—that actually Joe Schmidt does need to look at that Samoa game. Differently now. Oh, completely. He, he yeah. could have possibly yeah. given yeah. Johnny Sexton 20 yeah. minutes at the end yeah. and just fine tune mm. him. No. Whereas now, even though with that physicality of Samoa and with the risk of injury, no, he, has he simply go. has to play him. Yeah, he has to go because, you know, they will get a bonus point this weekend against Russia. You know, like Russia's that, they're just. You know they're brilliant and they're participating, but they're just not like they're all amateurs. So like they are going to get a bonus point this week, but you know, that's why you could probably give Joey an opportunity to just get up to that and then have a a decision. But the Samoa game and who knows what Samoa Samoa could have a say in it. I think Samoa could have a say in this group as well. The only thing that might undo them is their five day turnaround from Monday to Saturday next week. I think is probably going to be their their issue to try and get over that. You know physically condition wise they might not be up to scratch that could be their problem but I think the 
um, you know, the Samoa game is is massive. Samoa are a good side. They can't be overlooked. Like they're they have got bar the physicality, they've got some good ball players as well. Johnny, we gotta let you go. The Curra awaits. Yeah. What's the name of the horse? Three forty five. The game of life. He won <laughs> twice first in um in Dundalk and he ran. Joseph rode him in the Patsmon and Charity race a couple of weeks ago, gave yeah. him a bit of a blowout. So uh, Joseph did say that he was lucky. He the horse blew up at about the two furlong marker and then about two steps later Joseph blew up himself himself. So <laughs> it's a nice easy furlong and a half. So you feel confident as always well, not confident, but hopefully he runs. He's decent each way price, so I won't let what happened Thursday anyway. I might have a few quid each way on him, see where we go from there. Right. Thanks for coming in. Louise, Thanks, thank you for rushing no across the mare. Uh, enjoy the next 10 days over in Colorado. Will do. And I don't know, does anyone course. enjoy sevens that much in that altitude? But <laughs> we'll give it a go. Give it a go. Uh, and Neil, thanks a lot for hanging on as well. That'll all be up on offtheball.com. Plenty more reaction to come from Japan. We're going to hear from Sean Cronin in the next couple of minutes. Liverpool have made it seven wins from seven to start the Premier League season. Probably their toughest victory so far. A 1 0 win away at Sheffield United. Genie Vinealdum got the goal. We'll bring you reaction to that. Team news from all the three o'clock games and lots more right after these. Off the ball on News Talk. News Talk. Supporting the Irish rugby team in Japan. With thanks to Euronext Dublin, the new home of the Irish Stock Exchange. Supporting Irish business for over 200 years. Relaxing afternoons. 